Hello and welcome to Off The Fence, brought to you in association with Bet365. This is, of course, your weekly rundown of all things jump racing. And I am joined, as always, by Tony Keenan. How are you, Tony? Good, Vanessa. How are you? Yeah, I'm on very good form, actually, on this Monday. Very good form indeed. Barry Garrity, how are you in your standard blue shirt? How's life going for you? Yeah, standard as well, Vanessa. Enjoying lockdown and all the quietness. So obviously you're uh, feeling a little bit, uh, I would say, more full, full of life, I'd say. <laughs> I'm, I'm just on jolly form, guys. This is the highlight of my week, don't forget. You know, I live on my own. Um, <laughs> right, let's crack straight on with a look back at the week's action because... There wasn't any maybe particular sort of standout performances as such, but there's lots to get through because we saw lots of very interesting horses and none more so Barry Garrity than Envoy Allen uh, on Sunday. Obviously, the anticlimax with Asteria Falange falling at the first fence. Uh, uh, just from my point of view, I guess that what I took away from it is his jumping just impresses all the time now. His turn of foot was clearly still there and his electric, not much has changed in that, on that front, but... It was a less than ideal preparation for, if that is his last run ahead of Cheltenham, with those loose horses. How much of a nightmare is that uh, if you're riding in a race? And just kind of your view on that race as a whole with the loose horses and the carnage in general. Yeah, it, it was a test of, of Jack anyway. Um, and the horse was brilliant. He was so honest to take, keep taking on his fence. He never looked to follow the loose horses he just kept going about his business. And that's the thing about um, Esport and Dallin. He's just so, or Envoy Allen, should I say, he's just so professional and he measures everything. You don't have to ask any questions. He just agrees and does. He's, he's just a real pro. Um, obviously, the race itself was was robbed everything at the first fence when Asterian Falange um, checked out. You know, getting 11 pound, I thought he was really going to serve it up. And albeit you'd, you'd struggle to see him beat, um, and Vialum, but you know it was it was it was going to be a big test, and it would have been an ideal test. But you know he, he's just he comes to everyone with flying colours and Vialum, so it's um it wasn't ideal, but he learned plenty all the same between the loose horses and having to make the run, and he's he's just so straightforward. Yeah, he's so straightforward, and Tony just, I mean, it, a less than ideal race. I think everyone can see that, but. In terms of now building up to the Cheltenham Festival, where he's 11 to 10 on for the Marsh Novices chase now, and not much has gone wrong with him. I know generally you're a man who isn't, you know, I don't think you like sort of these massively short priced anti favourites, but anti post favourites. But what's your view on him now ahead of Cheltenham? Uh, is he invincible, basically? Um, I don't mind short prices actually. I don't. I just don't really like to take the anti post and things like that. Uh, just with the, the more risk of injury than that. As I, I actually would be a massive fan of his. I, I think he's a horse that has achieved a lot in races um, that wouldn't have suited as a younger horse. That he never would have really looked the champion bumper horse. He never would have particularly looked the Royal Bond horse. It's only when he's gone up and trip he's stepping into what, what really should suit him. I, I think he's brilliant to be honest. Uh, he'd be the one I would see as most solid of those three in the. In the three novice chases, it would take a hell of a performance to beat him. And I think he's also the horse that is, is most scary, I think, to uh, the opposition. I think he's the one that definitely I think the Irish trainers don't really want to take him on. Um, and you're talking there about how professional he is, but how unprofessional is this Asterian for Lange? He, he, he just seems to be <laughs> learning nothing with racing. Um, I saw some, someone say about, about his IQ. Um, yesterday that it wouldn't be up to much he, he's now he's now had five consecutive runs and done stupid things in the five of them I, I have no doubt that there is a massive performance in him someday probably right-handed heavy ground where he is going to put it all together but um where they go from here is, is tough um the, the race at fairy house at easter possibly but they want to get something in but in between then are they going to go for hurdles yeah he, he's a, he's a massive puzzler now for me what the what they're going to do with him yeah, for me as well. Um, so you've kind of answered Tom North's question there because he fired a question into us guys over the week where he asked Tom North on Twitter, I believe it was, asked, who would you most want to back at current prices for the festival? Envoy Allen, Shishkin or Monkfish? Tony, you've basically already said Envoy Allen. Is that right? Just a confirmation from Yeah, you. no, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Barry, who, who would you be going with there? 
I the same vote. I'd go for Envy Allen as well. I was second to him in the bumper in Cheltenham, and as Tony said, he looks like a horse who shouldn't be winning those races. But he just he's he races so you could call it lazily. He's so switched off, but he's so much speed when he wants to. He was nearly headed at the second last in the Drinmore, and then he just sprints away, and he sprinted away at the last um in Punchestown at the weekend. So. He's, he's probably a little bit unassuming insofar as he, he leads everyone to believe he's slower than he is, but he has so much pace and so much class. So he'd be the horse. He is the novice that you'd really want to take home. Yeah, I think uh, three votes for Envoy Allen with that question. And like you say, it's that acceleration and his accuracy of jumping that just I just can't get over. But anyway, um, let us know, viewers, who would you like to be backing anti-post? Uh, would you be going with Envoy Allen, Shishkin or Monkfish? It's a very good question for those novice chasers, uh, but it's three votes for Envoy Allen here. Um, we can move on to Nace, where we saw a couple of really decent performances, one of which was in the novice chase. And the uh, Jumen, there seems to be confusion over how we're saying this horse's name, but that's what I've rolled with. Uh, Tony, were you very impressed? I was he. It's hard to tell at Nace. Was he jumping out to his right down the back straight there? I mean, I thought his jumping was actually very slick, and I was impressed with him. But that he looked to be leaning out to his right a little bit, which you'd want corrected, I think, going to Cheltenham. Yeah, I did notice that. I do think in general you want to be on the outer at the chase track in Nace. Uh, the last thing you want to be doing is, is coming into the straight and caught up the inner. That, that's definitely the wrong place to be. The closer the stand rail, the better. No, I, I was hugely impressed with him. I thought he jumped better than in, in Gorham Park on chase debut. That was a, a good, a very good performance. Um, I thought his time compared uh, very well to Epsom Dew, the handicap chase winner. And I'd be quite interested in, in, in him in the arc. I think him and Shishkin could definitely be a little bit closer together. Um, in the betting. I suppose ground might be a little bit of a concern. They did swear of Leperstown, maybe with a view to avoiding decent ground, but he has won a decent ground as a younger horse. I'd say it's more of an unknown um, than anything. I think he's kind of a little bit underrated in that market because he never really did it over hurdles, but that was more to do with opportunity. Shishkin did get to run in the Grade 1 race as an obvious hurdler. Now, I mean, may well have done so at... Um, Punchestown, he was just a, a little bit of a late developer, missed out, missed out a little bit of time, and took in both bumpers and hurdles last season. So, yeah, I, I could definitely make a case for him being overpriced, especially if you can get some each way non runner no price, non runner no bet uh, prices in the arc. He'd be he'd be very interesting. Yeah, well, he's seven to one with bet three six five for the article. Barry, were you as impressed as well? And maybe, maybe, I, maybe I'm wrong about the way he was jumping. I just when I really watched it back, I was wondering if he was just drifting a touch, maybe. Yeah, I didn't. It didn't really catch my eye either. But um, it was a really good performance, and he showed great pace. Um, but loved the ground, and the ground was heavy. I'm not sure Captain Guinness enjoyed it as much. Um, so if the two of those go to Leperson, I would see Captain Guinness get closer to him. But I wouldn't see him beat him. Um, you'll get a better. Um, I think you get a better idea in Leopardstown, as regards how strong this fella can be against Shishkin come Cheltenham, just with how he copes with maybe better ground and how much real pace he has on that kind of ground. Albeit Cheltenham, the first day is well watered. It'll be good to soft and even close to soft, which would suit him. Um, yeah. But it, it'll be interesting to see how he fares in Leopardstown. But I. I I'd be very impressed with him and, and I think for that reason if you're talking about your the three novices which is the best of them I think he's he's made the Arca look a stronger race than it did beforehand yeah I like it like it a lot I think his his slickness away from a fence is pretty impressive and the other uh, big race at NACE at the weekend was the grade one Lawless novices hurdle which was won by Bob Ollinger in the end um, now a five to one shot for the Ballymore with bet three six five. Tony, is that uh, due to an absence of another significant Irish rival? What what do you think of that price? Yeah, I think that's a pretty skinny price. Um, uh, no, he has he has done everything right in, in, in his race so far. To be fair to the horse, but um, just uh, on collateral form lanes, I'm not a massive form of collateral form lanes, but this Gabinaco who finished toward seems to be quite a solid horse, consistent as running his race most days. Like Ashdiel Bob didn't um, beat him much less than Bob Ollinger did, and we're talking about Bob Ollinger being that four five to one shot for the Ballymore. Ashdiel Bob that actually made the race weaker, of course, on Wednesday when Ashdiel Bob fell very early on in the race. Also, the second, the Willie Mullins horse, he was keen for two miles of that race, eighteen furlongs of that race. So he he, he did himself no favours. He looked like a pure two miler as he actually did on debut. So I'm just not sure what Bob Ollinger beat. Um, 
it just hasn't been the strongest division that intermediate trip um, category just yet. I, I personally wouldn't be rushing to back him now at that price. I, I think I'd be looking elsewhere at the moment. Oh, and also, sorry, the one other thing. Yes, yeah. I have some stats actually in this. Sorry, I knew it's something else. Henry de Bromhead also, I, I would have... He's a much better, well, has a, not much better, but he, he has a much better record training chasers at Cheltenham than he does hurdlers. He's had nine Cheltenham winners in his lifetime, nine winners from 114 runners. Uh, he's seven from 73 over fences, but only two from 40 over hurdles. Two winners were Honeysuckle and Manella Indo. Uh, I do think that's, those numbers aren't noisy or anything like that. I do think that's the way he trains them. Um, he's very much training them with, with a view to fences and things like that. So that that would be another little thing I would have in the back of my head that um, he'd be the kind of horse that maybe would run red at Cheltenham rather than actually win it. Yeah, interesting actually, because I think people have really latched on to him after after Nace at the weekend. But uh, Barry, would you would you agree or disagree with Tony's comments there? Do, do you make much of this race? Yeah, I, I, it was a good race. Um, Gavin Ako, who set a nice steady pace, he settled well in front, having, for me, he ran very free um, behind Ashtel Bob, and he gave away any chance he had that day and probably did well to finish within seven lengths. So I thought that was a good run from him, but he had the run of the race in Nace, um, where Blue Lord, on the other hand, he pulled and pulled the whole way for two miles. For me, he would be the one I'd want to take out of the race. It was a good performance by Bob Allinger, but I'd imagine if Blue Lord settled the next day, he'd have no problem reversing placings and I think he's the hardest thing going forward for this race for the two and a half for the, the Ballymore yeah okay I, I yeah I, I, I kind of agree um, I was going to say something more significant there but our producers told me to hurry along now um, so we're going to head over to back over to the UK and focus on a few horses we saw I just wanted to give a very quick nod Barry to Next Destination who's you know, this grade one winning hurdler and then had so long off the track, a little bit like Alan King's horse last week, actually, a very similar profile. And then looks like a proper stayer now. Uh, we saw him at Warwick at the weekend. I was quite impressed by Next Destination. Yeah, he did well. He battled well. Um, but I suppose that the fiddler on the roof is the question mark on the form and especially with his horse's form as well. It's not amazing either. So he did well to win. As You know, as you said, he's, he's had a long time off. Um, but he'd need to build on that and he'd need to be better than that. Um, I believe they're talking about sidestepping Cheltenham maybe for entry, which I'd say would be a good call. Um, but he'll still need to improve on that. If something turns up with quality in, in entry, um, you know, he'll, he'll need to be better than he was in Warwick. Yeah, I think I think he. I'm hoping he might develop into a sort of a proper staying chaser. Uh, Eileen Dover as well at Market Raisin in the listed mare's bumper uh, for Pam Sly. Great little story there. Sounds like they're not selling her. Uh, they look like they might skip Cheltenham as well and potentially head elsewhere, maybe to Aintree. Um, just a quick word from you, Barry. If she was to tip up to Cheltenham on what we've seen so far, would you? Would would she have a ha would she have a chance in a champion bumper? Well, she showed great pace and there was good form in the race, but albeit it was all mares, um, so it's 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 hard enough to gauge. Um, but it was a good run. I think she's doing the right thing, going for the mares hurdle at our mares bumper in entry is the right race, yeah. and with the pace she shows, she's going to suit entry. But it's a big step from that to the the, the champion bumper at Cheltenham. So as I say, I think she's making the right call. Okay, so we'll look forward to seeing her, Eileen Dover at Aintree then instead and potentially next destination as well. Two good horses looking to skip the Channel of Festival. Uh, let's head back over to Ireland where one of the stories from the weekend, Tony, was the real deal winning the Moscow Flyer. Huge drift in the betting. The betting was kind of all over the shop actually pre-race. Um, couldn't really settle and lots of horses drifting and whatever. And he went off 22 to 1 I think in the end and he's now won that race and he's a 20 to 1 shot for the supreme novices uh, a bit of a mad old story with the real deal but um what did you make of the bosco flyer just as a race in general yeah well maybe before the race in general talk about the horse look in general i love to see the, the smaller trainer do well and, and things like that but i'm struggling to muster any enthusiasm for this horse with, with, with the profile that he has look load of runs uh, not sighted and then pops up at navin it started last winter Backed into six to four, Jockey nearly falls off at the first and wins doing a hack canter and then does the same in his next four starts. Um, look, I, I know following racing you have to have a certain tolerance of, of grey areas and handicapping of horses and, and things like that. And um, I'm, I'm not suggesting for a moment that there's um, 
that if there's any trainer absolutely whiter than white in this regard and, and they do have to play the game a little bit but this this case has made the handicapper look very very silly um for quite a number of runs and um i'm not really too enthused about celebrating it um as i say though acknowledging that there are other far bigger operations that do uh, similar type of stuff as the race itself oh it was such an enjoyable race to watch it absolutely but i i put up and back to echoes echoes and rain now oh, it was absolutely roller coaster stuff brilliant I, uh, the most enjoyable losing bet i've had in a long time um <laughs> But I, I would sort of, I wanted to get Barry's thoughts on this. I thought that every horse in the race and the sectional times would kind of compare this. I just thought I need to look this up. Um, every horse in the race had a hard race to some degree. The real deal, least so. And while I'm not saying Dennis O'Regan, uh, Dennis O'Regan gave the horse a grand ride, but there was a lot of rides in front where everything went too hard. I'm not knocking, actually knocking the jockeys so much there. I think Echoes and Rain's a bit of a mentalist and kind of pulled them all into it a little bit. But like the, the finishing speed for the race was like 97%, but the power for that course is like 103, 104. Uh, the last four forums of that race, they did it in like 65 seconds. The maiden hurdle after it was 59 seconds. Like that's like 36, length, 36 lengths faster. And of course, um, like the, the novice hurdlers are way better horses than, than the maiden hurdlers in this, you know. So it was an absolute, complete and utter pace collapse. And I also have a little theory about this, and again, I'd be very interested to get Barry's thoughts just generally. Uh, I find that races that are run in this really attritional fashion, where they go hard in the early middle part of the race and are walking late, they can take an awful lot of a toll on a horse. Now, I'm not saying every horse, um, because Barry was pointing out to me beforehand, some horses have great constitutions. Uh, I think an example of this was Super Sunday. You could give him w one of these every month and he'd come back from it. But there, there are other horses that just can't take this. And I think... A, I think one of the best examples you'd see from Ireland in a long time was the Size and Potsy race at uh, Ferry House, I think it was last Tuesday. Crazy gallop in the middle of part of the race. I think Size and Potsy would be some horse to come back from that. Aside from the fact that he had a fall, that, that's only an additional factor to it. It was just the, how hard they went in the middle part of the race. And also the, the two, the Percy Warner and um, Low Sun also would have had very hard races. And an even a more high profile example, I suppose, looking back, I think Gaspar Dallin's champion hurdle is a good example of this. Now, obviously, the horse came out of that and run well, um, and recovered the form after it. But to me, Lorena was never the same horse after that. Um, so it's just one thing, Barry. Like when you're riding in a race, do you feel do you feel at halfway or three quarters way you just know, geez, we are all having hard races here, and I'm going to have to go in and tell the trainer to give this lad a break afterwards. Or how does it feel? What would tell you that this is going to happen? Well, I suppose, just going back to the Moscow Flyer itself, and use it as an example, um, Dennis had the instructions to take his time, and, and Dennis does that really well. But at the point of the race, if you're going to two out, you know, jockeys are starting to look a position, and he was a long way off the pace at that stage, but he was happy to sit and wait. And that takes great patience, and it's not every jockey will or can do that. So I think Dennis deserves a lot of credit just for waiting and keeping out of the, 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 the fire, if you like. And then just played his cards late and the way he finished reflected how much he'd saved and how much he conserved and, and kept out of the battle so i think it was a really good ride albeit it was instructions but not everyone can just take it off or, or or carry it out but yeah you do have a lot of tough races but you know it's up to your jockey to make that call after halfway are we going too hard and be happy just to do as dennis did and just sit off and just you need to travel for me you always need to travel in fourth gear if you're in fifth gear at halfway, you're not going to get home. And that's where the hard race will come from is because you're going to be in fifth gear too early and your horse is going to be you know, running on fumes up the straight. Where if you can hunt and travel in fourth gear and conserve that fifth gear for the last three, four furlongs, that's, that's the difference. So your jockey plays a big part in whether your horse gets a hard race or not, but also his instructions too, because if he's sent out and told to make the running and go as hard as he can and make this a test of stamina, he's no choice but do what he's told. So... But those tough races, they do take their toll, but some horses bounce back and you know they run back soon. You see Native River, he'd pull out. He could be back two weeks after a hard race when the Welsh National, he bangs on again, he goes again, goes again. So some horses, their constitution, it takes it, where others, they'll, they'll lie down. You can only run them once a month or once every six weeks, and that's not even getting a tough race. 
Very interesting, isn't it? At the moment, the real deal is currently 20 to 1 for the Supreme Novices. Um, I suppose it'll be interesting to see if he ends up running there at all. Um, I know they said after the race they hadn't had the ideal preparation for it, so looks like there's probably some more improvement to come. Uh, Barry, we can move on to just a quick word on Dame de Compagnie, who made her chase debut today. Not my most favourite horse in training for different reasons, but she is now a 10 to 1 shot for the Mayor's Chase. I guess I just wanted to ask you very quickly, um, when she was hurdling, is she the type of horse, I know because they were debating whether to stay over hurdles or go chasing with her right up until quite recently, I think. And you had said before on the show that she would have to improve quite a lot to get up to a champion sort of level in a championship sort of level over hurdles from what we saw her when she won at Cheltenham. Uh, a, what did you make of her chase debut? She obviously made that shocking error, but other than that, it was pretty decent. And B, will she is she a sort to improve for fences? I think she will. Um, she jumped really well, but with the exception of one mistake. But she probably learned more in that one mistake than she did over any other fence. And it really showed over the last three. She was brilliant. Um, she should improve for the run. Um, but she jumped a hurdle for me like that she would jump a fence. So I think there will be improvement in her from, from hurdles to fences. So for me, in the mayor's, the, mayor's, the mayor's chase at the festival, she would be the right type. She's been there. She's won. She's, she's plenty of good course form. Um, but it was a really good performance. You could probably question the form, I think, with the runner-up because, for me, he disappointed in Haydock on his first run. Um, so he hasn't really reproduced the level of form that he showed when he beat Bouvedere last year in the fight in fifth. Um, so you could question that, but she can only beat what's put in front of her. And as I say, there's, there's a good bit of improvement due from her, I'd imagine, and heavy ground wouldn't be the ideal star for her. So I think she did really well, and she's definitely one to, for me to be on side with. Great, lots to like with her. Um, hopefully we won't have any handicapping appeals issues with her going forward. Let's move on to a bit of question time. And actually, I must say, we really appreciate all your questions and we're giving question time a little bit more airtime today because we've got so many good questions. So keep firing them in. Um, who are you fancying after the weekend, looking ahead to the big spring festivals? And any other random questions, throw them our way. We love them. And so we're going to crack straight on and barry it straight back to you because Craig Larvin has asked Barry very simply um, Epitant or Bouvedere? P.S. Bouvedere is overpriced so Epitant's currently 9-4 to four for the champion hurdle with Bet365 and Bouvedere is currently 14-1 to one, a dual champion hurdler making his reappearance this weekend straight up Epitant or Bouvedere please Barry it'd be very hard not to rate Epitant after what she did last year you you forgive her, her her defeat at Christmas, but her, her performance in the fight in fifth was brilliant and her performance at the festival last year was brilliant. So it'd be a brave call to turn her down for Bouvedere. But he's definitely he's he's not without his chance and fourteen to one. You could call him overpriced, but I don't know, it does there's, there's a lot of depth in there as well. And he has to go to Haydock and he you know, he's he, he generally improves for his first run as well and he's sung for someone maybe up there to contend with too. So that just won't be plain sailing either for a horse having his first run back. So you know, I think he's one to watch, um, but he's definitely not without a chance come the festival. OK, well, just uh, just focusing on his Haydock return, I just wanted to know from you, seeing as you know him better than most, uh, you said there that he will improve probably, and especially off this long absence for his seasonal reappearance. But in terms of if, if we're Bouvedere fans or if you're looking to back him for the champion hurdle, what... What should we be looking for at Haydock? I mean, is it is slickness of jumping or should the turn of foot still be there? What what are going to give us some pointers that say actually the fire does still burn for the champion hurdle? Yeah, his jumping is probably his, that's his trump card. He's so quick and so slick and measured. So you'd like to see him put in a good, smart, sharp round of jumping. But you want him to travel. If he travels like a good horse, um, you know, whether he's fit enough to go and win that on his first run remains to be seen. But if he travels and just shows that spark through the race, and especially, you know, until the, maybe the second last, that's where he could be found out for fitness. But you want to see him travel to that point. If he's if he isn't travelling for, for most of it, then you may be thinking he mightn't just be what he was. Okay. Well, I'm very much looking forward to his reappearance. It'll be a serious effort if they get him back to anything near his best. Because from what I've heard, the injury uh, from the fighting fifth with the fragments of the hurdle in his hoof sounded pretty horrific and. Yeah, good luck to them. It's a serious effort just to get him back on the track by all Team JP, as far as I have heard. 
Uh, let's rattle straight on to the next question. Jason Jackson has asked, uh, Tony, this is coming your way first. With the strong juvenile talent in Ireland, notably in Gordon's, which of course, Tony, is something we've spoken about quite a lot on this show, uh, surely one or two will have to go to the Supreme. The £7 allowance for this crop would be massive, in my opinion. I could see Quilixios running in the Supreme, I think he means, with Bally Adam rooted to the Bally Moor. What do you make of Jason's question, Tony? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, and I like the way he's thinking in terms of the ownership thing. Um, although I don't know, uh, would Colixius necessarily go, go to the Supreme? The way I would look at it would be more maybe the two Moran horses might split up. Maybe River de Tell might go for the Supreme. Now, she'd be getting two allowances there, not just a four-year-old, but the, the Phillies allowance. She'd be carrying a an absolute featherweight there. Yeah, no, uh, I would say with, I'd say the ownership way is the way to look at it. And very possibly he will split them the more than... Um, Oh, what was it? Fakir Duderiz went for the, the, the Supreme in Classical Dreams. You ran, ran quite well in it, yeah. So that, that's very possible. Barry, do you think that's a possibility from Team Gordon with those juveniles? Yeah, I think as, as Tony points out, there's a chance that, that the, the Moran's two horses could be split. But I'd imagine, you'll let you pronounce that again, Quilixios will call it. Quilixios. Uh, Quilixios would, would stay in the triumph and Bally Adam. It's unfair probably to judge Bally Adam on Leopard since you'd hope he's better than that and I'd imagine that they'd stay at the two mile for now. Okay, we like that. Uh, Adam at OB underscore 14 has asked a really good question as well. Will Rachel Blackmore get a choice on who to ride in the King George? If Manella Indo disappoints in the Irish version, uh, sorry, in the Gold Cup, of course, uh, if Manella Indo disappoints in the Irish version, is there a chance she could ride a Plutard? Uh, Tony, where do you think Rachel, what, what do you think of that question? Where do you think Rachel will go here? Oh, well, I'm sure she hasn't made up her mind yet. I'm sure, like the rest of us, she wants to see a little bit more evidence at this point. Um, Manel Indo is going to have another go at that um, Irish Gold Cup. Although, again, uh, I've seen it, Gordon Elliott mention it again at the weekend, this issue with the Leopardstown chase track. He, he mentioned it in reference to Envoy Allen that he, he didn't really want to run there. He, he thought he'd be taking too much of a chance with the ground being fast. Um, just one little thing I think I think we chatted about this briefly but we still don't really know where we are with this RSA chase form um, Alho hasn't done anything for it but I suppose the two key protagonists Manella Indo and Champ haven't really had a chance to do it yet um, so yeah that, that that's still a little I would, I'd like to know a little bit more about that race and, and, and the value of it uh, at the moment Okay, Barry, um, if I said to you now, it's time to get off the fence and you need to pick who you're riding in the Gold Cup between Manella, Indo and the Plutard, which way would you be going? I'd probably go for uh, Manella, Indo. Just, I know he's, he obviously fell last time wow. and you'd like to see him do better, do better in, uh, in Leopards on the next day and obviously in Cheltenham, but... I think our Plutard, although it was, a, it was a good performance to win in Leopardstown and Dara O'Keefe gave him a brilliant ride, um, I think he needs to be better than that to win the Gold Cup. So I'd take a chance on the horse that we haven't really seen his full potential and maybe he's been good enough. But yeah, I think there's, a Plutard will need to be better. So I'd take a punt on Manila Interesting. I didn't, didn't think you were going to go that way. Surprise me, Barry Garrity. Right. Uh, let's move, actually, before we move on, another shout out for more questions, because as you can see, they raise some interesting points and we like to answer them. So fire your questions in on YouTube, on Twitter, on Facebook. The producers who are not shouting at me as much today on the running order here, uh, they read them all. And so we pick the best ones and we try and answer a few of them. Let's move on to a quick look ahead to the weekend's action where at Ascot, the Clarence House Chase, live on Sky Sports Racing, of course, we get to see Politolog versus Deffy Desoy. And Barry, I know that you're really keeping the faith in Deffy Desoy. I think you have a very, so well, you have a soft spot for him by, or by what you said so far on this show. Uh, he's had such a contrasting season to the one he had last year, of course, when he won this race. He's now coming here off the back of two disappointing runs, essentially. Um, what what do we need to see from him now? Can, can he beat a sort of red hot on form politologue? And even if he puts it up to him, what, what we need to see some spark back from Deffy, don't we? Yeah, we do. Um, but he did travel well in Cheltenham last time. You can forget his festival run. Um, he never turned up, but he travelled well in Cheltenham last time. Um, until getting very tired that was his first run back on heavy ground and they went very quick so 
he was found out um, for me as much fitness maybe there was something else lurking there but fitness was going to be a you know there was an element of that to feed you could put down to fitness so you know this is like a first run back from again so he, he'd imagine he's going to improve for the run he's obviously taking on Politolog who's in really good form um, but you'd love to see Deffy just with that spark travel jump um, it'd be hard to fancy him to beat Politolog on Saturday but I, I waiting patiently I would feel differently about he was third in the Tingle Creek last year behind Deffy um, I think he was 19 lengths ahead of Politolog that day so for me on the back of his run in the King George which was a great run and shown in the Tingle Creek last year that he has the pace to be competitive over to I think he's the one Politolog has to worry about and he probably is some bad value against him very interesting he's a very fascinating supplementary entry as you've said uh very interesting point so just to confirm barry you in terms of deffy you actually if he ran well he jumped well and he traveled well you think that he'd come on fitness wise and actually he's, he, you know people will inevitably if he gets beaten again start to write him off for the champion chase but from what you're saying actually it's far from we're far from at that point with deffy it's just a bit of a work in progress this season You'd like to think so. Um, okay. You know, he generally he improves from his run, so you'd look you'd look for a good show, but he, he will he will improve, I'm sure, for that. Okay, Tony, do you have a view on this uh, on the Clarence House chase in general? Uh, Waiting patiently, very fascinating. No, not particularly. Uh, I don't know what to make of that King George form. Uh, I don't know if we've drawn any firm conclusions of it. A slow, slowly run was it? Uh, I'd been trying to think Political Logan will, will win again. Yeah. I think, I think three votes for Politolog maybe on Saturday, but going ahead, it's probably a much more wide open debate for the champion chase. Uh, who do you think will win the Clarence House? Get involved. Let us know. Who do you think will take the Clarence House chase this weekend? It's had some brilliant winners over the years. It's actually a race I absolutely love. Um, so very much looking forward to that. Live on Sky Sports Racing, let us know who you think will win. And to wrap things up, because we're getting to the end of the show, it's tracker time. Uh, who to add to your tracker? Barry Geraghty, who's your tracker horse from the week, please? I'm going with Colonel Mustard, uh, who ran in Punchestown over the weekend. Um, travelled very strongly, ran a bit keen, um, but travelled for a long way really well. And for me, the ground was very heavy, and he looks like a horse would be better suited by nice ground. So it's just, he's at two runs over hurdles now. He was second to Bally Adam as well. He's good experience for a horse going back into a maiden or even into a handicap. So I think when he gets a bit of better ground, he doesn't need good ground, but just better than heavy, I think you'll see him do well. Okay, Colonel Mustard for you. Tony, who's your track of horse, please? Yeah, well, I would actually echo Barry's horse. Thought that horse shaped very well and coming off a break as well. Uh, I liked another horse that ran the maiden hurdle, actually won the maiden hurdle in Nace last week uh, on Eagle's Wings. Um, he was conceding fitness to most of his rivals and also hurdling experience. He's kind of an unusual horse in that uh, Heights have, have held on to him rather than sold him on. But he, he's uh, also unusual in the fact that he's won two bumpers in Ireland for, for a relatively small yard. Gordon Elliott horse, Willie Mullen horses do it all, all the time, but not so much these from the smaller yards. One of the horses he beat in the bumper was Statler. So that, that's, a, that's a good level of form. He seems to handle any ground. Um, but at Nace last week, I thought he didn't jump great, but one thing he has is a very willing attitude. Um, the same as he showed in his bumpers. He, he likes when something comes at him, and he keeps fighting to the line. Um, I think he might be able to win a, a small graded novice hurdle, and definitely an ordinary uh, novice hurdle. He's one, one to keep an eye on. I expect improvement in his jumping from the last day too. Uh, thank you very much for that, Tony. And my tracker horse is a pretty obvious one. I don't think anyone will have missed him as such, but it's just a quick nod to the race. Uh, tracker horse is mint condition for Jenny Candlish uh, in the Ballymore Leamington Novices Hurdle at Warwick at the weekend. I like that race. Mint condition was the only, well, the best finisher coming from off the pace, the first and the third. Both were up in the vanguard for most of the way, and he's a horse who is going to get a hike in the handicap, but he's probably still going to be worth a bit of value with his handicap mark, and they'll probably throw him back into a handicap hurdle. So I'll be keeping Mint Condition on side, and I thought Tom Lacey's Ad Ramil um, is a pretty decent horse, actually, and made quite tough work of it, but definitely a horse for me to keep on side, maybe not for the spring festivals, but going forward chasing, etc. Uh, I like that race a lot. So I think... That brings this show to an end. Thank you very much for everyone's contributions. Thank you very much, Barry uh, and Tony. Thank you. And thanks for watching. Um, please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel because that all helps. And like I said, 
get involved. Questions, retweets, likes, any feedback you have for us is always much appreciated. We read it all. That was Off The Fence.